The rule against commandeering is a product of a fairly small number of recent U.S. Supreme Court opinions, beginning in the 1990s. It's a specific application of the larger concept of federalism. So to best understand commandeering, we should start by thinking about the usual role of federalism in constitutional conversations. In constitutional discourse, federalism usually appears as a particular type of structural argument. A judge who thinks federalism is important is necessarily arguing two things. First, that constitutional structure is one of the most important considerations in any case. And state power is one of the most important features of the Constitution's structure. Now, our various methods of reasoning can potentially be used to reach answers in a lot of different legal settings. Arguments from federalism are no different. They can appear in lots of settings, too. A few examples will show how this works. Imagine a case where the main issue is preemption. The question is whether state law must yield to some federal statute or regulation. Now, a federalism argument would recognize that less preemption would lead to more state power, and that state power is considered a good thing if you care about this particular vision of federalism. As a result, federalism could become a building block towards the ultimate result on the preemption question. For questions involving the breadth of individual rights, a federalism argument would recognize that rights protected by the U.S. Constitution are a limit on state power. So as a result, structural concerns about state power could be among the reasons for deciding the scope of the right. Federalism arguments are extremely common whenever the question is whether Congress has exceeded its enumerated powers. A narrower view of congressional power will lead to more latitude for the states, because there will be fewer federal laws that could potentially override state ones. In those examples, federalism was potentially just one argument among many that could be used to resolve questions about the extent of federal powers or the scope of federal rights. Now, the rule against commandeering has become something more than just one legal argument among many. It's one of the very few situations where federalism principles have been ruled to prevent Congress from exercising power that it otherwise has. Imagine some law that would otherwise fall within an enumerated power of Congress. So long as the law does not take the form of commandeering, Congress should be able to pass it without violating any federalism principle. However, Congress cannot use any of its powers in a way that would amount to commandeering the state governments. This is a federalism doctrine that actually limits powers that would otherwise exist. The rule against commandeering says that Congress cannot directly compel states to enact or administer a federal regulatory program. Now, the key words here are regulatory program. As it appears in the commandeering cases, this term refers to some sort of law that regulates how non-governmental entities must behave. In this slide, we see some private people and private entities at the bottom of the screen. All of these folks might be subject to regulations from different levels of government. They must obey the federal laws that regulate them, and they must obey the state laws that regulate them. There might also be regulatory laws imposed at the county or city level. Now let's contrast ordinary lawmaking with commandeering. This occurs if the federal government issues some sort of command, typically through a statute or regulation, that orders state government to enact certain regulations that the state might not have chosen for itself, or it orders state government to do the legwork of administering the federal law. If commandeering is allowed, it would mean that the state has been compelled to act as Congress's enforcer, either in terms of administering the law or enacting it in the first place. And this contrasts with ordinary lawmaking, where Congress enacts and enforces its own laws. Here's a hypothetical federal law that requires state and local police to apprehend people who have violated federal immigration law. Pause the video and decide if this would be commandeering. The previous example would be commandeering. 
Congress certainly has power to enact immigration laws, but it can't force the states to administer those laws for it. Instead, Congress needs to do one of three things. It can let the law go unenforced, it can pony up the money and the personnel to administer the laws itself, or it can convince the states to voluntarily assist. And indeed, it's not uncommon for local police to volunteer to enforce some federal criminal laws, like the laws against robbing a federally insured bank. But this is a state choice and not a federal command. Now consider a recent Supreme Court case that involved a law against sports gambling. Pause the video to decide if this is commandeering. The Supreme Court held that this law was forbidden commandeering because it told the states which kinds of gambling laws they could or could not enact. The law in Murphy was commandeering, but does this mean Congress has no power over gambling? Not at all. Congress can regulate gambling because, in the aggregate, it has substantial impact on interstate commerce. It's just that Congress can't use commandeering as its method for regulating interstate commerce. So what Congress could do is pass and enforce its own anti-gambling law. And if this happens, states have the freedom to decide for themselves what the laws should be. Now, if, as in this example, the state enacts a law that is completely inconsistent with federal law, it might be preempted. This example shows how the rule against commandeering is very much about how laws are written. In our ordinary lawmaking example, Congress without question has an impact on the states, and the states may have to make their decisions with an eye towards federal law. But the states are not being forced to pass a particular kind of law. This example also blends into one last topic. Namely, certain types of laws that students sometimes mistake for commandeering, even though they really aren't. Remember from our definition that commandeering is when the federal government tells states how to regulate private individuals and entities. If instead the federal government is telling states to do various things that are not themselves regulations of others, then there's no commandeering. And indeed, there are many places in the U.S. Constitution where Congress is explicitly authorized to regulate the state governments. Some of these are found in Article I, where Congress has power to limit certain activities by states. And even more of these restrictions were introduced with the Reconstruction Amendments. If Congress uses powers like these to control the activities of states, there's no commandeering, because such laws would not be commanding the state to regulate others. Similarly, Congress might enact regulations that apply to private individuals and entities, and also to state governments. So long as this federal program is otherwise constitutional, there's no commandeering when the federal government regulates states along with others. At this point, please pause your video and consider whether the federal government can require state employers to pay a minimum wage. This example is not commandeering, because Congress is not telling the states how to regulate other people. Congress can pass minimum wage laws under the Commerce Clause, and it has been held that they can apply that to the states. So this is a law that is authorized by the Commerce Clause, and whatever other objections there might be to it, there is no commandeering.